welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer as we approach the word today. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we're grateful for your presence in this place already. God, we thank you for what you've already done in the hearts and lives of people. God, we don't want to stop there. We want to go deeper and further with you, God. We want to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. So God, as we open your word, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. Open our hearts to understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we thank you that your word is rich. It's alive, God. May it just bless each and every person, God. We thank you, Lord, that you are so wise and so great that you can just touch each individual heart in a very personal way, God. We give you praise and thanks for that. And God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. We pray that you would bless them and speak to them, God, just as you would bless us and speak to us this day, God. Lord, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. We're all in agreement. We say Amen. amen. You may be seated. Get your Bible out. Go with me to the book of Hebrews I'd like to also welcome those of you that are watching online. Thanks for joining us. I believe the Word of God is going to speak to you as well today. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, we're going to be in verse number 12 and verse number 13 once again. Just like my dad used to tell me at the dinner table, son, there's some more meat on that bone. And so we're going after the Word of God. You know, this isn't meant to be fast food. We're not racing through the book of Hebrews, have you noticed? And especially verse number 12 and verse number 13, it's, it's like a fine meal that you take your time with, that you take small bites and you get every bit of flavor and nutrition out of it that you can. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12, starting, says this. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. Now, we've already had several times together in the Word of God, and I wish we had time to review all that has been spoken, but you can get a hold of the messages on the importance of the Word of God and the piercing Word of God and the designer future that you can have with the creative Word of God, and my goodness, it's just been so rich and so good, so go online and get them for free or go out to the CD counter, and they have those messages available for you there as well. And and, and here's where we're going today. Not only is the word of God living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, but it says, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Verse number 13, and there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now, last time we were together in the book of Hebrews, Pastor Luke did a great job of talking about our account before God, but we're going to back up into verse number 12, the end of verse number 12, talking about that the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then into verse 13, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Today, I want to talk to you about the discerning word of God, the discerning word of God. Today, as we approach the word and as we open it up, we find out that not only is the word of God living, not only is it active, not only is it powerful, not only is it creative. Not only is it piercing, but also it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, what does that mean that it's a discerner? What does that mean? Well, in in the Amplified Bible, I I believe it kind of describes this even further. And it says that uh, in the Amplified, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. You think about an archaeologist. Here's an archaeologist, and we all would just see a big mound of dirt, And we would think, well, maybe there's some rocks under there. Maybe there's something, I don't know, from an age past. There might be some some old sediment, some old, you know, things that you could find in there. But really, all we really see is a big mound of dirt. There can't really be anything underneath that. But an archaeologist will see the area, will will know what, what had gone on in that region, and will see that mound of dirt and say something else. They'll say there's bound to be something on the inside of that. And they'll start to sift through the dirt, they'll take big piles of dirt and they'll take it and, and they'll, they'll shake it through different channels of different sizes of grates and, and there they'll, they'll find out what's in all of that sand and in all that sediment. The other thing that they'll do is as they pull away the dirt, they'll find these massive rocks and, and where we would stop and say, oh, that's just all that there is, they'll keep chipping away and they'll keep going further and they'll start to expose 
what's on the inside. They'll start to, to find things. And in fact, in the Strong's, when it talks about this word discerner, it says tracing out and passing judgment on. See, what they'll do is the, these archaeologists, they'll trace out, they'll find out these bones and these systems of interlocking bones, and they'll find a skeleton. They'll draw it out, and they'll trace it out, and then eventually they'll piece it together. And based on what they see, they will make a judgment concerning that thing. They'll say, this skeleton is maybe a saber-toothed tiger. And we can see that from the way that its paws were worn down on the back that it did a lot of running. We'll see from the way that its teeth are worn that it ate a lot of hard bone and it, and it cut through and they'll make a judgment concerning what they see there. They might classify other things that they find, different plants and different animals and, you know, this is a brontosaurus, this is a supersaurus, this is a whatever saurus, you know, and they'll, they'll go through and they'll find out, they'll draw out, they'll sift through, they'll trace out and then they will make a judgment on what they find. In the same way as we get into the Word of God or as I should say the Word of God gets into us starts to open up and starts to take a look at what's on the inside, sees the thoughts and intents of the heart, starts to trace out those things and starts to put things together and show us what's going on on the inside of us, starts to make judgments. And notice that it says not only the thoughts, but also the intents. So you can think about something. You can have an opinion about something. You can ponder something in your mind, but never purpose to do anything with it. But there are other things that go on on the inside of your thoughts that eventually translate into our actions. Why? Because it went beyond a thought and went to an intent, and now it's a purpose in your heart. You think about something long enough, eventually it will translate into your actions. For instance, you're thinking about buying something, right? So what do you do? You go and you research it. You go online. You find out the reviews. You see which is the best one at the best price. You see what kind of quality you want, how much money you want to spend on it. You're thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. Eventually, those thoughts, when you put things together, when you draw it out, when you trace it out, now you can pass a judgment. This is the best one. This is the best price. And now I'm going to buy it at this place. And it becomes an intent of the heart and a purpose of the heart. And eventually, that thought will carry you into an action. So the Word of God will draw out, will trace out what's on the inside, will show us what's going on, but it will also show us the purposes of our hearts. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why you do what you do? you ever thought about, why do I wake up and do the same thing every morning? Why do I brush my teeth starting on the top? And then I go to the bottom, and then I go to the inside, right? Why, why do I do that? Why do I do the same thing every time? How come when I drive home from work, I drive home the same way every time? Everyone, it's because there was a thought process that went on. When you moved into your home, you said, what is the quickest way to get home from work? And you drove several different ways, you found several different paths, you, 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 you routed it out, you calculated it out. Maybe you, you and, and your husband or wife were driving home and you said, okay, you're going to take this route, I'll take this route, whoever gets home first will know that's the shortest route. Anybody other than me and my wife do that? Okay, good, I'm, I'm glad we're not the only crazy people in the place, <laughs> praise the Lord. But what happened? You were thinking, what is the shortest way home? See, there was a thought and eventually it became an intent and now all of a sudden it's in practice in your life. See, sometimes we don't even know why we do the things we do. There may be another way home that's prettier, but it's a minute longer and you're not going to waste that minute. <laughs> there may be another way home that has less traffic, but you got home 30 seconds earlier with the traffic, so you'll endure the traffic to get that 30 seconds in your life, right? Why? Because you thought this is the quickest way home. You purposed in your heart to get home quickly, and therefore it becomes an action in your life. Have you ever wondered why in certain areas of your life you just simply can't succeed? Why do things keep coming up over and over and over? Why are we dealing with the same issue again and again and again? It's because there's a thought process that's going on in your life. There's something hidden in there that's going on that becomes an intent and, an, and a purpose in your life. And eventually it leads to that action, and you can't get over it because it all starts with the heart. And so the Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It will draw those things out. It will open it up. It will expose it, and it will make judgments on it. We see Jesus in action. Jesus was, was, uh, was teaching in a house in the book of Luke. You don't have to turn there. I'll put it up on the overhead for you in a second. But Jesus was teaching in a house, and there was such a crowd around Jesus 
As Jesus taught, there was, there was people standing everywhere. There was people piled on top of people. There was people out the windows, people out the doors, right? Couldn't even get near to it. And there were some guys that had heard about Jesus and heard that he had the power to heal, that he was doing the miraculous. And they had a friend that was paralyzed and was lying on his bed. And so they said, we're going to take our friend to Jesus because we want Jesus to heal him. And so here they come to the house where Jesus is, and they find out that it's capacity, you know. You can't stack anybody else in this house. There's people spilling out the doors and out the windows and everything else. So what do they do? They say, we're, we're not going to give up. We're going to go and get after this thing. And so they take this guy up on the roof. And they start to peel away the layers of the roof, start to dig through. And they expose Jesus to their friend. They start to lower their friend down through the roof. Jesus sees what's going on, sees these men, sees their faith, and what does he do? He doesn't give them what they want immediately. They wanted their friend to get healed. But Jesus looks past the surface level. He sees the man being lowered down. He sees the faith that they have, and he gives them not what they want, but rather what they need. And he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Wow. I don't know about you. But me personally, if Jesus was talking to me, I'd rather have him say you're forgiven than you're healed. The reason why is which is more important. Well, when I go before the Father, and when I had given an account of my life, I want the Father to say, hey, all that stuff you messed up, all the bad stuff, you are forgiven. You are free. You, it's not being held against you. It's under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, praise the Lord. I'm, I'm forgiven. So he says, son, you're forgive, your, your sins are forgiven. Now, all the religious minds of the day, they raise up and they say, blasphemy, right? They're thinking this in their heart. No one's talking. They all kind of stiffen up and, oh, blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Look at what Jesus says in Luke chapter 5. We'll put it up on the over. Luke chapter 5, verse number 22. It says, but when Jesus perceived their thoughts. Remember, we're talking about the discerning word of God. Jesus is the word made flesh. And so here, Jesus discerns their thoughts. He sees past the surface level. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? In other words, Jesus just read their mail. Looked right past all the religion, looked right past their authority, looked right past their education, looked right past their social status, looked right past all of that stuff, the facade that they had put up, and said, why are you reasoning in your hearts? What are you doing? What are you thinking about right now? What does he say? So that you will know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins on the earth. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise up, take your bed, and walk? Well, they all know the answer to that. It's easier to say your sins are forgiven because you can't see that. But he says, so that you'll know that I have the authority to forgive sins. Man, rise up and take your bed and walk. And what's the guy do? He stands up, grabs his bed, and he walks out of the place. And yet Jesus exposed these religious minds of the day to what was going on on the inside of their heart, revealed it, and passed judgment on it. So today, as we approach the discerning word of God, I'm going to make a statement, the discerning word of God will, and we'll complete it a couple of times to get an understanding about what the discerning word of God will do. Listen, if we're ever going to change the things that we don't like, the things that we know are wrong in our lives, if we're ever going to have a good success in our life, if our marriages are going to succeed, if our children are going to grow up raised up in the ways of the Lord, if our finances are going to be blessed and we're going to prosper in our life, if we're going to leave a legacy here on the earth and do something worthwhile, we've got to get real and raw with the Word of God. We've got to allow it into our lives. We've got to allow Jesus to open up things and expose things. And so we've got to allow the discerning Word of God to do some things in our life. The discerning Word of God will Number one, reveal what's hidden in the heart. The discerning word of God will, number one, reveal what is hidden in our hearts. Someone once said that the thoughts of men are heard louder in heaven than their words are heard on the earth. God already knows what's in our hearts. God sees all, God knows all, and so we're not fooling him. We can't build a wall that God can't see past. We can't cover things up. God knows what's in our heart. And to some degree, we know what's in our hearts too. 
Why do I say to some degree? Because there are things that sometimes we're ignorant of. We don't even know that was there. We say, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize, you know. And, and there might be some things from our past or some things that we were just doing, just operating, but we didn't even realize the thought process that got us to that point. Sometimes we say, wow, you know. I didn't. But, but to some degree, we know what's going on on the inside of our heart. We know us pretty well. And, and, and yet, sometimes we think that we can fool God. We think that we can hide from God. We, 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 we sweep issues under the rug, and yet the word of God, when it gets on the inside of us, goes in there and pulls up that rug and says, what are you doing here? What's this? We put on a mask, and we try and be something that we're not. Come to church, right? Bible in hand. Oh, praise the Lord, brother. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And then we go to work, and we're at the water cooler talking with all the people about everybody else, using words we shouldn't be using. See what's going on. There's something in our hearts. And if we're going to change, we have to allow the word of God to reveal what is hidden in our hearts. We can't deceive ourselves. See, sometimes we can deceive ourselves. It's okay. It's all right that I'm like this. Grace will cover that. God will forgive me. We can deceive ourselves and we can explain away things. We can justify ourselves. Sometimes we say, well, God's okay with my sin. He knows my heart. Right? Yeah, he does know your heart. And no, he's not okay with your sin. That's why Jesus died was to cover that sin, to take care of that sin. And now God wants us to change. God wants us to walk his way. God wants us to do his will. And yet we can deceive ourselves. And sometimes we can just ignore things. I know it's there. But I'm not going to deal with it. Maybe I'll deal with it later. Maybe when I grow up. Maybe when, when, when I'm older. May, maybe when the kids are out. Maybe, maybe when they change, I'll change. See, we can ignore things in our life, and yet the Word of God will reveal what is hidden in our hearts. If you turn with me to the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter number 17 there in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 17, and in fact, as you read through Jeremiah, you find so much about the heart. It's just awesome. Jeremiah chapter number 17. And we're going to take a look at verse number 10 together, but let me read verse number 9 to you. It won't be up on the overhead. Talking about the heart, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah chapter 17. Talking about the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. See, before Christ, the heart can deceive itself. I'm okay. It's all right. It doesn't really matter. I'm not hurting anyone else. It doesn't affect anybody else. No one sees. Not a big deal. And he says, who can know it? And in verse number 10, the Lord starts to answer that question of who can know it. Look at what it says. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. And that word mind in the old King James Version says the reins. That, that's the deepest place, the innermost part of the man. Uh, uh, some, sometimes it's translated the guts, right? God knows your guts. God loves your guts, too, in case you didn't know that. But God knows what's going on deep down in the recesses of who you are, that deepest part of you that we try and cover up and that we try and hide. Listen, God opens it up and God reveals it. God shows it to be what it is. He says, I, the Lord, test the heart. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. See, sometimes we see something in our heart, and it's just this little thing, just this little weed sitting in there. We say, I could live with that, and that's fine. But listen, when you ignore that little thing, that weed will start to grow, and where there is a root, it will eventually bear fruit. Sometimes we don't like the stuff that's going on in our life, and God is opening us up and saying, hey, look at this. This is why this is happening over here is because you didn't deal with this issue. It was a little thing that has now turned into a big thing, and now it's affecting your life, and it's bearing fruit. And so the Lord is the one who searches the heart. He tests the mind. He goes deep down into the darkest part of who we are. And he says, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. I like to think of it like this, is that the word will turn you inside out so that you can see what you're all about. Wow. When you get into the word or when the word gets into you, it will just turn you inside out so that you can see what's going on on the inside of you. So the discerning word of God will, number one, reveal what is hidden in our heart. Number two, the discerning word of God will strip us of the cover-up. 
Number two, the discerning word of God will strip us of the cover-up. What do I mean by that, strip us of the cover-up? What do I mean that? Well, the word discerns our heart and truth. We can't hide behind a mask or a wall that we've built. All things are naked. They're exposed before God. In fact, the, the, the New International Version in verse number 13 talks about that all things are laid bare. They're naked. They're exposed before him. Literally, the word talks about in the old times when they would, when they would expose the neck, they would rip away the clothes and just, rip, just pull that neck out to expose the neck, right? Uh, talking about like, you know, an executioner, right? So they needed to expose it. So they would pull the clothes away and they would open it up and they would twist it and expose it, right? And that's what's going on. God takes a hold of our hearts and he rips away the masks. He rips away the veils. He rips away the walls that we've built, the things that we've tried to hide behind. And he lays it bare. He lays it out. He lays it open. And we can no longer hide behind the things that we've built. Nothing that's going to stop God from seeing what's going on on the inside of us. When you allow the word, that piercing word, it will cut through. It will open up. It will divide. It will take away. It will sift through. It will draw out. It will trace out. And so the word of God, as we allow it on the inside of us, it will strip us of the cover-up. We're not fooling God, and no longer are we fooling ourselves. The way to get out of the deception, the way to get into a position to change is that you are to allow the word in, allow it to pierce you. Yes, sometimes it hurts. Sometimes in church, you might be saying more oh me's than you do say amen. And that's okay because it gets you in a position to change. Preaching good to myself. Back in the New Testament, turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter 5. In the book of Ephesians chapter number 5 find that it's talking about you and I, talking about the Word of God on the inside of us. Ephesians chapter number 5, starting in verse number 8, and we'll read through verse number 14. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, says this. It says, for you were once darkness. Now, hold on. Hold on. Wait a second. For you were once darkness. Notice that it didn't say you were in darkness. Hmm. You were once darkness. See, you were once a child of the devil. You were a part of that family because you had entered into sin and rebellion. You were at war with God and you were on the opposing side. You were once darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. So you were once darkness, but now you are light where? In the Lord. So when you gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ and Jesus got on the inside of you, he transferred you out of the kingdom of darkness and he brought you into the kingdom of light. And now Jesus, the light of the world, lives on the inside of you and you are the light of the world. So you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Look at what he says. Walk or live out your lives as children of light. So if we're going to change from our old ways, change from the darkness, and, and, and we're going to do something with God, we have to walk, we have to live out our lives as children of light. How do we do that? Look at verse 9. For the fruit of the Spirit. See, when the Spirit gets on the inside of you, when the Spirit, when the Word of God starts to take root in you, it will bear fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Well, good is what God says, right? Righteousness is the will of the Lord, the way of the Lord. Okay, it's both the position that you have in Christ Jesus, but it's also the practice of godliness, of goodness. And it says, and truth. That means there's no deception, there's no lie. And so when the Spirit gets on the inside of you, it starts to change you from the inside out. Look at verse 10. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. See, sometimes we think, my goodness, I have to know everything all at once. When we get born again, we put these expectations on ourselves that says, I have to do everything right all at once. Otherwise, I'm wicked, I'm sinful, and I'm probably not really saved. Yeah. And yet God is saying to us, listen, this is a process. If you've crucified the flesh, it takes time to die on the cross. Are you listening? And so God is saying, you are to take that, you are to walk, to live out your life as children of the light. Yes, there is a present reality that you've been born again, you're brand new on the inside, but in your actions, in your thoughts, your mind has to be renewed. And so you get renewed through the word. And as you learn things, as you start to find out what is acceptable to the Lord and you do those things, now you walk and you are pleasing in his sight and you're living in the light. And that's what God wants for you and I. And when we find out that there's a way in us 
that's not pleasing to the Lord. That's where we start to change. That's where we start to allow the word to work on us. It's where we allow the word to show us what's on the inside of us, to open us up, to reveal the thoughts and intents of the heart. Oh, that's not pleasing to God. That, that's not good. That's not what God says. And then we start to line ourselves up with the word of God. Look at what it says. Verse 11, and have no fellowship. What does that mean? That means don't have a friendship. Don't link up with. Don't have dinner with. Don't follow on Twitter. Don't be friends on Facebook with. Don't, don't have any thought. Don't hang out with. Don't, don't, don't eat with. Don't have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. See, you were once darkness. Now you're light. So don't have any fellowship with those unfruitful works. But rather expose them. Well, how do I expose them? Well, we we're talking about the discerning word of God, right? Verse 12, for it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them. Where? In secret. In the hidden places. Shameful to even speak of those things. So how do we do this? Verse 13. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. The, the, your word is truth. Your word is the light. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So the word of God gets on the inside of us and exposes those things of darkness, that wrong thinking, the, those wrong motives, the wrong purposes, the, those, those ill intents that we have on the inside of us. You get the word of God on the inside of you, and all of a sudden it shines the light and starts to expose what's going on. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now, I was thinking about this, and, and Dr. Becker used a, a great illustration one time, and it just went off on the inside of me. He said, if you were, you know, going uh, down into a cave, and you started walking around this cave, and they had a system of lights that showed you where you were going and that sort of a thing, you get down in the cave, and all of a sudden, there's a power outage, right? And it's so dark that you can't even see your hand right here in front of your face. You know, you just, you can't see a thing. The moment somebody says, oh, wait, everybody, hold on, don't move. I just happen to have a flashlight with me in case of an emergency like this. And they turn on that flashlight. Did you know at that moment that person becomes the leader? Why? Because they have the light. And they can shine it on you and they can say, hey, don't back up because you're going to fall down that cavern right behind you. And you, you say, okay, and you start moving forward, right? Well, what's he say? Awake you who sleep, arise, and Christ will give you light. Jesus is the leader. And if we allow the word of God to lead our lives, then Christ will give us light. He's the one that's shining in our hearts. And he's the one that makes us the light of the world. And so here he is, and he's saying, he's exposing, he's making manifest. He, he's opening up things to us. He's showing us what's on the inside. He's shining light in our hearts, and he's saying, hey, look out there. Don't walk there. Go, go this way. This is the way. Walk in it. And so we follow our leader, Jesus Christ. Like how Andrew Murray said that the light that shows you your sin and wrong will surely lead you out. You see, God's not in the business of lumping condemnation and guilt all over us and shame, kicking us around and treating us like a dog. No, God is showing us our sin and opening and exposing those things. In fact, that part of the Holy Spirit's job description is to convict the world of sin. But he's not doing that so that we are broke down, busted, and disgusted. No, God's showing us that so that we can get out of it. God's showing us that so that we can walk in his way. God's showing that, us that so that we don't have to stay in the slump, to stay in the dirt, to be down and out, to be broken, and busted. No, God is showing us that so that we can rise up, awake up, that we can rise from the dead and follow the light of Christ and we can walk into the blessings of God. So today... So far, we've learned that the discerning word of God will, number one, reveal what's hidden in our heart. Number two, it'll strip us of the cover-up. And that brings us to the final thing for today. And that is that the discerning word of God will open us to his word. The discerning word of God will open us to his word. See, when you get this in you and it takes root in you, then it will bear fruit in your life. It will start to come out of you. See, those thoughts that you entertain, those things that you think about, sometimes we, we, we start thinking about a lustful thought, and eventually that translates into looking at something we shouldn't be looking at or going and having a relationship with someone we shouldn't have a relationship with. 
Sometimes covetousness will start here in the thinking. It'll get down in the heart, and all of a sudden, we're going out and spending money on things we shouldn't be or stealing or whatever it is. Sometimes there's, there's lies that go on on the inside of here, and pretty soon we're gossiping or we're, we're talking about things we shouldn't be talking about. See, it all starts in here. But when you get the Word of God in here and when you start to get the Word of God on the inside of you, then all of a sudden you're thinking about the Word of God, and then what happens? Garbage in, garbage out, but good in, good out, right? And the Word of God gets in you, and all of a sudden the Word of God will start coming out of you. You get the blessing of God on the inside of you. You get the blessing of God out of you. You get the prosperity of God on the inside of you. You get the prosperity. You get the healing of God on you. You get the healing of God out of you. See, whatever you put in is what you're going to get out. You start putting encouragement inside of you. You're going to start being an encourager. Why? Because you've been encouraged. Start putting good words on the inside of you. Good words will come out. Love how Amy Carmichael, a missionary, uh, back in the day, I, I believe in the early 1900s, said that a cup filled with sweet water, no matter how hard you jostle it, can only pour out what's on the inside of it. Not even one drop of bitterness. And so you and I have to fill ourselves up with the things of God. Literally, the end of verse 13 there in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, to whom we must give account, could be translated, to whom is our word? Well, what does that mean? That means that if our lives conform to his word, then on the day we give our account to God, our word will be acceptable in his sight. Wow. Let me say that again. Let me say that again. If our lives conform to his word, then on the day we give an account to God, our word will be acceptable in his sight. That's what we want. We want Jesus to say your sins are forgiven. We want the Father to say, well done, good and faithful servant. We want to live well here on the earth, receive our reward in heaven. And by the way, our reward is him. And so God is desiring for us to start to get this word on the inside of us and start to confess what he confesses, start to say what he says, and get the word of God in us so that it can live its way out of us. Turn to the book of Psalm chapter 51. Let me show this to you in the word. The discerning word of God will open us up to his word. Psalms 51. King David writes Psalm 51 in a time in his life when the word of God had revealed something to him. You know the story, King David, here he was at the time when kings went out to war and he stayed back, he stayed home. Not necessarily a sinful thing, but not necessarily what he's supposed to be doing as king. And there he is, he's lounging around, having a good time, hanging out, wakes up late, goes out to the top of his house, looking around, and he sees a woman taking a bath. In fact, her name was Bathsheba. So here's Bathsheba taking a bath. And what happens? King David starts to think, hmm, she's good looking. And that thought turns into an intent of the heart. I, I, I'd like to be with her. So what does he do? He sends his servant, hey, go get that woman for me. So she comes to him. He lies with her and sends her away, right? He's the king. He can do what he wants. No big deal. Then he finds out, hey, wait, 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 this is the wife of another man. He's committed adultery. Goes on, she comes up pregnant, right? Now he's got a problem. This is going to be revealed. Her husband's out to war. I should have been at war. Her husband's out to war. How'd she get pregnant? So he decides, well, let's cover it up. Let's work with this. Calls her husband in from the battle line, says, you've been doing a great job. Come on, you can eat with me. Get some drunk, right? Go ahead, have another, have another cup. Tilt it up there, buddy. <laughs> go home. Be with your wife, man. Have fun. You've been doing a great job. You can go back to war later. But this man is so righteous that he, he won't even go home. He just lays on the doorstep. He says, how can I be with my wife when my brothers are out there fighting? So he lays on the doorstep. King finds out about it and says, this is not good. Can't cover it up anymore. We have to do something with this guy. So he sends him back to the battle lines, sealed letter to the commander of the army, says, hey, I want you to take this guy and put him out in the heat of the battle and then withdraw from him so that he dies. Sure enough, they do that. And now King David is stacked up not only uh, uh, slothfulness where he should have been out doing what he's supposed to be doing, not only uh, lust in his heart, not only adultery now, uh, now, now there's lying and, and there's also murder. And so he's just stacking up the offenses Man's now dead, so he takes Bathsheba to, to himself as his wife. Hey, we're good. We're married. God loves marriage, right? Now, now we're cool. Everything's good. So he's living his life. He thinks he's covered it up. Thinks that there's nothing wrong anymore. Now, now he can just live his life, and he's cool. 
And what happens is the prophet, who represents the word of God of that day, represents God to the people, comes to David and tells him a story. He tells him a story about a man who defrauded someone else with, with some sheep. Now, David was a shepherd. And so David gets raging mad about this little sheep, right? His heart is just, just, just drawn into this story, and he finds out, and he says, this man should be punished, right? And what happens? The word of God just rips him wide open, opens him up, exposes him, removes the cover up. Nathan points his finger in David's face, and he says, you are that man. When you coveted your neighbor's wife and went and lied with her and then had him murdered. Now, oftentimes we can think about that story and we can get very afraid. We say, God will expose my deep, dark sin. God's going to do it. But listen, God is not in the business of keeping us down. God reveals those things to do something with us so that we can change, so we can live our life. And what happens is King David repents. What does that mean? That means that he changed his thinking. He no longer thought, this is okay. I can do this. I'm the king. It's all right. Whatever I do is righteous. It's fine. No, he changed his mind and then he changed his direction. It went from here to here, and then it went to his actions. And he repented before the Lord. After everything's all said and done, he writes this psalm, Psalm chapter 51. If you have some time, you might want to read through it during the week. And in Psalm 51, I want to just focus on verse number 6. Psalm 51, verse number 6 says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. God, you, you desire your truth, your word, the light to be on the inward parts. He goes on to say, And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. That's what this is about. See, when the word of God gets on the inside of you, it's the wisdom of God. God wants to get that deep down into the recesses of our life where it's unseen, where it's hidden. God wants to get it into the secret place. Why? So that it can bear fruit in your life. What this comes down to is that our ways and our doings are open before God. We're not fooling him. We're not hiding from him. And further than that, the reasoning behind what we do is open to the Lord. Therefore, if we're going to change our ways, it has to start in the heart. We've got to get the word of God deep down inside of our heart. You're there in Psalm 51. Turn with me to Psalm 139, another great psalm to read during the week. You'll be amazed at how well God knows you. The psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I run from your presence? If I go to the heights, you're there. If I go down to the depths of the sea, you're there. Darkness and light are alike to you. I can't hide anything, God. But look at what he does in Psalm 139, last two verses of Psalm 139, verse 23 and verse 24. The psalmist writes and he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Now he's inviting the presence of the Lord in. He's asking God to come in. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Look at what he says. Try me. Test me, God. Prove me. Try me. And know my anxieties. In other words, the psalmist knew that there was stuff in there that made him anxious, that he had anxiety about, that he was worried and, 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 and just couldn't get off his mind. God, I want you to come in, search me, I want you to test me and try me and know those things that I know are there, God. Get a hold of them. And he goes on to say in verse 24, and see if there's any wicked way in me. God, see if there's any stuff in there that I don't know about. I know about the anxieties, but God, maybe there's some other stuff that's contrary to your will. Maybe there's some other stuff that's contrary to your way. God, get in there. Get a hold of me. Get deep down in. Now, how does he apply it? Take a look at the last part. And lead me in the way everlasting. Don't stop with just searching, God. Lead me out. Don't stop with just trying me and testing me and showing me these wicked ways. God, lead me. God, I'm ready to follow. My eyes are fixed on Jesus. You are the light. You are the leader of my life. And now I'm going to follow you in every area of my life. That's what this is all about. The point of what we're saying today about the word discerning our thoughts and intents, not just to expose, not just to reveal, but to give the sound judgment of the Lord and steer our lives back into the ways of God. How do we do that? Well, the process would be, sometimes people say, what's the process? How do I do this? How do I live this out? How do I apply this? When I go home today, what am I supposed to do? Glad you asked. See what's inside. When you get into the word, when you get into church and you start shouting amen, and then all of a sudden you start saying, oh me, right? And, and the preacher just read your mail and you said, how did he know? Did they bug my house? What's going on here? And God just gets his finger on something in your life and starts to show you something. You feel like you got turned inside out. Start to see what you're all about. The cover-up has been ripped off. And now you're exposed to the Lord. Now let the light of his word lead you. That's where you see it, how God sees it, and then you say it how God says it. 
You say, God, I confess this thing in my life. God, I, I bring this thing to the light right now. Lord, Lord, you see this? See this in my heart? God, you know this is here. And God, now I see it as you see it. Lord, that's wrong. God, I repent of that and I turn to your way. You know, if you're dealing with lust or something like that, you start to confess the word of the Lord that I, I, I will flee youthful lust and I will pursue righteousness, faith, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. If you're, if you're dealing with anger, you, you start to confess the word of the Lord that I will be angry and not sin. That, that I'll put a guard on my tongue and, 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 and purpose not to speak any unclean thing. That I, I will put away lying and I'll put on the deeds of light. I'll put on righteousness and truth. If you're dealing with covetousness, if you're desiring things, you say, Lord, I, I purpose in my heart to be content wherever I am found. Lord, knowing that my provision comes from you. And that, Lord, you are the one who satisfies me. As the deer pants for streams of living water, so my soul longs after you. And you start to turn and change your desire. See, the tongue is that little rudder of the ship that changes the direction and the course. That's why we get the living, active word of God that opens us up, exposes us on our tongue. Why? So that we can start to go the direction of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Today. The discerning word of God will, number one, reveal what's hidden in our heart. Number two, it'll strip us of the cover-up. And number three, it will open us to his word. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to talk to you guys before you leave. Just give me a couple more minutes of your time, and then I'll let you go. So please, no one, no one get up, no one walk around, no one leave during this time. Come on, just focus in, because God wants to speak to you. I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No one will know the answer, but you and God. Here's the question. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Just quietly answer that in your heart. Listen, God searches the heart. He knows your answer. So let's examine your answer because it tells a lot about where you're at. Sometimes people say, well, I'm, I'm going to heaven. I, I don't really believe in hell, and I don't think that, that God, a good God would have a hell. But listen, hell is a very real place. It was never designed for you or I. It was designed for the devil and the angels that rebelled, and so God doesn't want us to go there. But we can choose with our life where we go. And denying the existence of hell doesn't make it any less real. Not all roads lead to heaven. It's like saying all roads lead to the moon. It doesn't work like that. You can't just deny the existence of hell and say, I'm going to get there just because, you know, I don't believe it. That's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. You know, you go stand out on the slow lane of the freeway, you'll meet one face to face. Hell is a very real place. Jesus talked about hell, and so we better find out what it takes to get to heaven. Sometimes people think that, you know, if they're just a good person, been a good person, pastor, done a lot of good deeds, helped people out, gave money to charities, that's great. I'm glad you did those things, but could you show that to me in the Bible where they get you into heaven? Because it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you help people, be good, be nice to your neighbor, give money to charity, that gets you into heaven. In fact, the standard is perfection. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one's perfect except Jesus. So you're not going to get there just by being good. Sometimes people think, well, my parents told me we were Christians growing up. Took me to church, took me to religious classes, Sabbath school, Sunday school, catechism class. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? Born in America. America is a Christian nation. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you raised in church, parents tell you Christian, you're a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible say you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or Christian, be born in America, that that gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. And again, nowhere do I see in the Bible that it says that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. That's how you think you're going to get to heaven. Come on, let's love you enough today. Honor you and respect you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. So you might say, well, yeah, when I, that was when I was a child, but here I am in church right now. I mean, I, I consider myself a Christian. I'm sitting in church. Great that you're sitting in church, but did you know that you can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible say sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's like saying I can sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. Not going to happen. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. So you might be thinking, okay, I understand that, but my last church I got involved. I helped out, I carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader, sang in the choir, taught in the classes, even got a membership card to that church. It's great, once again, glad you did those things, but... Show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You sing in the choir, teach in the classes. That gets you into heaven. Nowhere. You won't find it in the Bible. It doesn't get you into heaven. Now, I don't see anywhere in the Bible God's waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. That's how you think you're going to get to heaven. You're not going to make it. Come on, let's talk today.
about where you're at because your eternal destiny is at stake. Sometimes people think, well, I know God. I know about Jesus, Easter, the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. It's great. I'm glad you do those things. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible say you know something about God, you know who God is, celebrate a holiday, that gets you into heaven? It doesn't work like that. But I can quote scriptures, Old and New Testament. That's great. So can the devil. He's not a Christian headed for heaven. Just because you say you know God doesn't mean that that qualifies you for heaven because the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Bible tells us. They're not Christians headed for heaven. Everybody look up at me for a second. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God headed for heaven. But rather, this is about your heart. It's always been about your heart. We've been discussing the heart today. God knows your heart knows where you're at. And so... Jesus made this statement to a man by the name of Nicodemus, religious leader of his day, did good deeds, raised up in his church, could quote scriptures, could sing the scripture. Jesus doesn't commend him for his life. He rather tells him these words. He says, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They raked it through the coals. Listen, it's not about what society says, it's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart, that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible, the third chapter. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying, lukewarm? What does that mean? Well, it means a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then. Occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Three, bang, pop my hands together when I say three, just like that. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, hold on, we'll do it all together. Praise the Lord. Somebody's already excited. Well, listen, what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, but wait, wait, wait. If you point at me and count, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh. You might be, but get over it. Because think of the trade-off. Wouldn't it be better to be embarrassed for a moment than it would be to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. So today, come on, in a safe and friendly place, you can get right with God. I won't embarrass you. You know you won't be alone. Somebody's already excited about giving their heart to the Lord. Come on. We give them all of your heart. We give them all of your life. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? You're lukewarm and you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, wherever you're at all over the world, come on, you can raise your hand. God sees you. And then you can press, press the blue button right afterwards, respond to God, and you'll be led in a prayer to give Jesus your heart and your life. Come on, in the sanctuary here today, you can get right with God by simply raising your hand. Here we go all together on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two. Thank you. There's three up on top. Gotcha. There's four. Both hands are raised. Praise the Lord. There's four wise people already. Where are you at? Five. Thank you. Where are you at? Come on, just give me a little wave if I don't see you already. Thank you. Six, seven. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? There's eight up on top. Gotcha. Gotcha. Eight wise people already. Oh, I know there's more than eight. Come on, where are you at? Just lift it up high. If you don't think I've already seen you, eight, there's nine, got you, there's ten, thank you. Anybody else real quick? Ten, you can put your hands down, thank you, I got you. Praise the Lord, there's ten wise people already. Where are you at, number eleven? You know you need to do this. Thank you, there's number eleven. Number twelve, come on, come on, I already got you, thank you, thank you. Eleven wise people. Number twelve, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should, go for it. Number twelve, thank you, God bless you, got you, got you. Anybody else? Anybody else, there's twelve wise people. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Anybody else? All right, come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
Now, all 12 of you, or if you're number 13, number 14, number 15, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, a Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you grab your stuff, get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So if you're in the foyer, you raise your hand, you can come in wherever you're at. If you're at the Love Rock Cafe, tell an usher. But if you're in the sanctuary, you raise your hand, or even if you didn't raise your hand, you just come right now. Come on, let's all stand and welcome them. You come. Come on, come on, come on. Won't you come to stand Hallelujah, they're coming. They're coming. Nudge your neighbors, y'all go with you, friend. Come on. Oh, and hear the spirit call. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Won't you come just as you are? Anybody else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. Come on. Come and see. They're still coming. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Anybody else, if you need to come, just make your way down. Come on. All right, all right. Hey, everybody up front. Everybody, look up here for a second. Put a big smile on your face. It's a good thing, not a bad thing, all right? God's good. You didn't come to die. You came to, to life, all right? The old man's going to die. That's okay, because he didn't really like that guy anyways, right? And he was doing all sorts of bad stuff. Now it's time to allow the Word of God in. You're going to be led by God and do things God's way. That's good. We want to help you as a church. Here's, over here is my friend, Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy, okay? He's going to do a couple things. Number one thing he's going to do is pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do is give you some free stuff, a couple little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then the third thing he's going to do is introduce you to a friend we have in church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. Basically, they're going to come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things. That's one a week out of the Bible. Meet you before church service. Real easy, real simple, and free. Okay, you need to do this. Why do we do that? Well, listen up, listen up. If you give us one year of your life, commit to one year, coming to church, finding out about the things of God, I guarantee you, I promise you this day, that at the end of this year, you will say, my goodness, God is amazing. God's done wonderful things in my life. He's turned me and my world upside down. God's going to do great things in your life, but you got to get in and you got to commit to it. And an SPT will help you for those first five weeks to get you started in the right direction. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah.